Okay, recently I've been asked to do a video about Java classes and explain how they kind of work. Okay, or just classes in general. So the way that you've probably been doing your main program without classes up to this point is you have a program and so you have your main program. And then basically the main program will be doing you know various different things. All right, and the main program probably runs sequentially and just does everything by itself. Right. Um, we may have also introduced uh, some new methods. Okay, so you may have methods or something. I'll just call them f. So you might have like some function, another function, and so on and so forth, and then main. Okay, and so far, um, then you probably have main doing some things, and then what it does in the middle of those calls, it might go back to f. Okay, f returns something. Then it might ask f. The other f to do something and so on and so forth okay and so but all of these run sequentially and all of these are part of the same class meaning they're all part of the same group of things right so what that allows you to do is to uh, separate some of the code uh, from main which allows you to reuse code or break up the code but it still makes a procedural program right? so with classes it's a similar type of concept Okay, so what we have is we have our main program. Okay, so we have main. Okay, main still can have its own methods or anything else. But what main can, but what we can do in our program is we can create a, another helper program, so a completely separate program that can help. Okay, um, so what am I call this? Is like a class. All right. So as main is running. What it can do is it can define this class into, well, it doesn't define it, it instantiates a class into existence, okay? And then that class is used inside the main program, okay? But the class is uh, doing its own thing, right? It's actually not part of main, okay? Um, usually what a class is, is a class is something that represents an object. Okay, and that's a little bit confusing for some people to at first. Like, what is an object? Okay, well, the classes, okay, so let's see here, represent an object. Okay, now what is really an object? Well, an object is a collection of attributes. Okay, so it has attributes. And it also can usually do things, okay? So those are methods, okay? So the class has, is an object that either has attributes or methods, or has both, has attributes and methods. And what a class is is a way of grouping similar, um, well, it's a way of representing something, okay? Something that we're choosing to model all together with a, um, into one package and giving it abilities to do things on its own. Okay, and the benefit of using a class is that we can get the class to, um, to do its own thing, which doesn't really bog down the main program anymore. Okay, and it also allows us to modify the class so that it's, it can function or it can be changed without having to change the main program. The main program isn't really concerned that much about how the class works. It just, can, it just is concerned about whether or not the class can actually uh, perform its task or not. Right. Let's go to the code and I'll try and give you an example. Well, let's look at a simple and typical type of uh, computer program where we might use a class. So let's say, for instance, we want to make a program that um, has a mathematical model of a classroom or something like that. And in that classroom, we want to model a student. Okay, well, modeling a student um, would require you to represent some of their attributes. Okay, so for instance, you would need to have string name okay, um, for their name. You might also have to have another string for their ID number. You might have to have something like an integer for their age and another integer for their grade. And you could also have like any other number of attributes. There's probably a lot of different attributes. Okay, um, then you would also have to create things that this person could do, this student could do. Um, it could be any number of different things. So let's say you wanted them to be able to add something. 
Okay, so what you might be able to you might want to do is say um, boy or int add. Okay, and this is just going to take two numbers. These are trivial examples, so you wouldn't actually ever use something like this. Okay, well, you might, but it doesn't really make that much sense. Okay, but it's just to illustrate a point here. Okay, so here we have some something of a student, and this student knows how to add. All right, and we just give them one more method uh, called the same multiply. And all that does is return number one times number two. Okay, so here we have a representation of a student in our program. Um, but what if we wanted more than one student? Okay, well, that'd be really difficult, right? Because um, you'd all of a sudden have to keep track of all these different things. And let's say we had 30 students, or in current classrooms, about 40 students, right? So the only way you could really do this would be to change all of these attributes into arrays. Okay, and then you'd have to have all these like parallel arrays, each one to keeping track of each student. And you'd have to remember which student was student zero and which student was student one and so on and so forth. Um, that's okay, I guess. You can still do it that way. But the whole thing, the whole reason why this isn't really that great of a way of representing this or modeling this is that this, you're doing a lot of work in the main program, but this is really not the key part of the main program, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to change this and make this into a class, all right? So what we do is we start a new uh, program, go file, or just go to new class. You guys can't see this, but I'm just pressing the new class button. Okay, and here I'm going to say class student. Now, uh, convention says that uh, classes should always start with a capital letter or class names should always start with a capital letter. All right, and we're going to take away this public static void main because we don't need this. Okay, so we're going to go finish. Okay, so now when we start this, we just have public class student and really nothing else. All right, so what I'm going to do though is I'm going to take these out and say, you know what, I'm not going to put these in the main program. I'm going to bundle them together as a student. Okay. Now I'm going to get into access modifiers uh, in a moment. You just You'll just have to wait here or just be patient with that. And I'm going to take these, okay, which are the things that the student can do, and I'm going to add them to here as well. The order doesn't matter, okay, but typically um, the, the member variables come first, okay, and the member methods come, or the class methods come after. Okay, so now I have thing a student, and a student can do has these attributes, and it can do these things. Okay, so save that, and go back to our main program. Now, when we look at it, our main program is very empty. So what we can do is we can, if we wanted to make a student in the main program, we could say student, um, and we'll just call him, I don't know, Jimmy. Okay, like that. Okay, now this doesn't actually create a new student. Okay, what this does is it generates a name and tells the program that Jimmy is the name of a student. Right? However, it does not create a new student yet. Okay, in order to create a new student, we have to say new student. Okay, like that. Okay, now this creates an, an actual student, but this student has no name. So what we do is we attach them like that. Okay, so we create the name, then we create the student, and then we attach them together. Okay, so that this name now represents this student that we created. Okay, now, if we want, we can demonstrate that Jimmy, the student, can actually do things. Okay, so print line. Um, all I'm going to do is just output uh, a sum or a um, product here just to demonstrate that Jimmy actually is existing in the main program and operating correctly. Okay, now one question is how do we access the different parts of Jimmy?
Okay, well, we access the different parts by using a dot operator. Okay, in mathematics, a period represents a decimal, which is a portion of something else. Okay, and it's the same thing in Java, where the period represents a portion of another thing. Okay, so what I'm going to say is I want to access Jimmy, and the portion of Jimmy I want to access is the add method. Okay, and I'll go 5, 6. So Jimmy, add 5, 6, and the main program will print that out. Okay, we'll run it. Okay, and down here I get 11. Okay, so it shows that Jimmy is actually working correctly. Okay. Now, there's a couple of different benefits to using a class like this. All right. One is that we can create or we can bundle a lot of these similar things together, right, to create a, to represent an object. Right? It also allows us to distribute work easily. Okay, so it keeps your program organized, allows you to distribute work, um, it allows you to modify or compartmentalize your program. So what you can do is you can actually like have a different part of your program, okay, in pieces or parts of your program in pieces, and then you can modify those pieces without having to worry about changing the other parts of the program. All right. Okay, so we have Jamie add five six. Okay, and we can look, and here we have this stuff available here. Now, there's a, there's a little more that goes into it than this, okay, but ultimately that's the essence of this, is that is being able to bundle a bunch of methods and attributes or variables together so that you can represent an object, okay, in your program. Okay. Now, there's a couple other things. Um, a lot of people have asked about the, will ask about what does this public mean? Okay, well, these are the attributes and methods of the class. Okay, public and private refers to whether or not or who's going to have access to these things. All right, typically, all of the member variables are private. Okay, and the reason why is so that the class can be protected. You don't typically want the class to be able to access um, things on its own. Okay, or sorry, you don't want other classes to be able to access parts of this class without permission. Okay, private means that only this class can access its own ver member variables. Right, and it's just going to say they're not used. Okay, so that's what the private member is for. Okay, public means that any other class can access these these parts of this class. All right, and it kind of makes sense. You don't want these member variables to be accessible because they can be changed to be something that doesn't make sense. All right, you want to keep control of that inside this class so the class can make sure that it doesn't get changed out in a way that would be harmful to it. Okay, so you can tell it doesn't actually change anything here. I have a warning here. What's going on? Static method it should be accessed in a static way. Yeah, okay. We'll go over that in just a minute here. Okay, so we have private, uh, all these private and public things. Typically, methods are public, typically. Um, the reason why is because the, me the, the methods are the things that the class can do. So if they're not public, it means that other classes can't ask that class to do those things. So it's kind of weird um, because if you can't ask that class to do that thing, then what's the point of having it there? right? So it's like if I create a painter and I'm not allowed to ask him to paint, well, there's no point in creating a painter, right? Um, however, some classes will have private methods. So usually those are ones that will be helper methods for the other things. So they're like a method that is not meant, is meant to help another method. Okay, it's meant to help a public method, but it's not meant to be invoked on its own. So it's, it's possible or sometimes even reasonable or necessary to have private methods inside the uh, class as well. Okay, but typically the ones we're going to write are going to be public. So you have these two public things that you can do. Right, and you can see it doesn't change anything. Okay, it still runs 11. Okay, and it just changes to, I don't know, 4. You know, see if it comes with a 10. Yeah. Okay, we'll talk about static uh, later. All right, um, but first I want to talk about um, different parts of the class. Okay, so if all of these are private, well, how do you access them? Like, what if you want to know what grade the student is in, or what if you want to uh, know the name, or you want to um, 
change the grade. You want to move them to a different grade. Okay, well, the way we do that is access those is creating getters and setters. Okay, so getters and setters. Okay, also known as um, accessors and modifiers. Okay, now every getter and setter is written in a, usually the same way. Okay, uh, for instance, uh, I'll do one for their age. Okay, for the getter, it's a just a method. Okay, so it's going to be public static void or now, if it's a getter, it has to return the age. So the method's return type has to be the same as the variable. So it's going to be int. And the name is always going to be get age. Okay. There's rarely ever parameters for getters. Okay. And all it does is just return age. Okay. And it's going to give me crap because this is not static. Okay, I'll explain what static means as I said later, but just for now, just bear with me. All right, now for a setter, again, it looks very similar, public, static. Now, a setter just sets it, so it doesn't actually have to return anything. Usually it's a void method, okay? And the name of it is set and then whatever variable name. So this one would be set age. Now, the variable is going to have to have um, a name. So it's, we have to have a new data to set it to. So I'm going to say int uh, new age. Okay, so then what we would say is that the age is equal to new age. Okay, so you have age is equal to new age. Okay, like that. All right, so we have a getter that can get the age and a setter that can set the age, all right? Now, a question you might ask is, well, what's the point, all right? Like, why would you care about setting these to be private when you can just change them and access them here using public methods any way you want? Well, the answer to that is that you don't have to allow them to access, you don't have to allow people to access your class members um, in a just an uninhibited way here. Okay. For instance, with set age, what I could do is I could put in an if statement and say something like this. If age is greater than zero, okay, age is equal to new age. Okay, meaning that the age cannot be less than zero. Okay, it can't be a negative number because that wouldn't make sense. All right, so you can what what you allow the class to do is a means by which to protect itself. Okay, so maybe uh, changing the age to a negative number would cause the program to crash. Okay, well this makes it so that class cannot be a the class age cannot be a negative number. Okay, and would just reject that that request for a change. Right, so in this way the class can protect itself. Now Eclipse, uh, which I'm using, has a cool way to actually generate all these. It's in the source menu. Okay, um, I don't think you can see that, but it's in their source and then it's under, um, where is it here? Generate, there's one for generate uh, getters and setters. And I can't, oh, there, I'm in refactor. Generate getters and setters, where is it here? Here we go. Generate getters and setters. Now, notice that the age um, the age attribute did not show up here because I already wrote the getters and setters. So I'm just going to generate the other ones. Okay, and just choose. Okay, here you can choose the different access modifiers. Okay, and you can see Eclipse will generate all of them for themselves. Now, you may notice that the setters here use this command called this. All right. Um, okay. The way that that works is here I created a variable called int new age. Okay, but typically we don't want to create a variable with the same name. Okay, so what they've done, what they do is they've taken a parameter with the same um, with the same name as the class member variable. Okay, so we have this age, which is a method variable. So this age, the one highlighted, belongs only to the method. This age 
okay, is a class member variable which is belonging to the entire class. They are different variables. Okay. Now the problem is that if I say age equals age, what I'm doing is I'm saying the member variable is equal to the member variable, which is really just a waste of time. Okay, it doesn't do anything. It's just saying number is equal to itself. Right? What I need is a way to represent, to tell the computer, I'm not talking about the member or the method variable, I'm talking about the class variable. And what we do is we use this to say that. Okay, this keyword, okay, so the this keyword, okay, place that void, this dot age is equal to age. I cannot use this in a static context. That's so weird. Okay. Okay. Now this dot age is equal to age, and what this means is that the class's age is equal to the method's age. All right. This keyword refers to it sends a pointer back or a reference back to the to the class that called it. All right. So when you say this, you're talking about the student. All right. So that's what that's how it works. Okay. So we go to the main program here. See now Jimmy knows how to add. Now if I wanted to find out Jimmy's age, I would say get age. And there's no parameters for get age. Okay, just print that out. And Jimmy starts off with an age of zero. Now what if we don't want Jimmy to start off with an age of zero? Okay, like it seems kind of stupid that like you'd still have to go and make all these things start. Like what if this is a high school program and students start at age of 15 and in grade 10, okay, or something like that. Okay, well what we can do is we can introduce a method um, that will help us to initialize the, the class when it's created. All right, that method is called the constructor. Okay, the constructor is a special method that's only ever run one time, and it only gets run at the beginning when the method is created. Right? It looks like a method, but it looks a little bit different. Okay, so I'll show you. It has public. Okay, and it has the same name as the class, student. Okay, it can have parameters, but it never has a return type. Okay, so it's just public student. Okay, in some other languages, it's just it would just be student like that. Okay, and I suppose in Java it would it would default to public anyways if you just wrote it like that. Okay, um, do okay. Now what we can do is well you can really do anything here. You can open a file. You can run like a loop. You can play a little game or anything you want. But typically a constructor sets up the member variables and gets the the object ready for use. So let's say for instance. I said this is, let's say, high school students and they start at age 15. Okay, so by default, the age would be 15. The name would be equal to, um, I don't know, Jane Doe. And their grade would be in grade 10. Okay, so they're always going to start off in like this. Okay, so what happens here is now when I create Jimmy, Okay, so Jimmy gets created, but his age now, as you can see, is 15. And let me just okay, age 15. Now that allows us to create the the variables in a very specific way here. Okay, or to set up a default set of values for that variable. Okay, you can overload the uh, this constructor, just like you can overload any method. Okay, so, okay. Let's say, for instance, I want to say string. I'm going to get rid of this uh, ID one just because I'm not using it right now and I don't want to deal with that many variables. String name, and down here it's not going to like it because it has getters and setters for it. Okay, so string name int age, int grade. Okay, so I can say this 
dot age is equal to age. This dot grade is equal to grade. And this dot name is equal to name. Okay. So now what I could do in the main program is I could actually create Jimmy a different way. Okay, so when I invoke, when I call this to tell the, uh, the computer to create this student, I could provide different information. So for instance, I could say his name is James, and I said age and grade, so let's say he's 16 in grade 11. Okay, so now we run this, and we have the age of 16. And we'll run the other ones here as well, just to demonstrate how this works. Age, name, get name, get grade. Okay, so age 16, name James, grade 11. Okay. I could change it anything I want here. So I could say he's only 14 in grade and he's in grade uh, 10. Okay. And if I take these away, okay, then Jimmy, the variable Jimmy, will have very different ones. Okay, so age 15, Jane Doe, grade 10. So what happened is because we did not specify any arguments, it matched the parameter with these parameters, so no parameters, and it went to this constructor. Okay, so I've built the object in a different way. Okay, and that's how the constructor generally works. Okay, now the last thing I want to talk about is this concept of public and private. And for that, I'm going to need an illustration. So as I said, the classes can represent um, okay, different objects or representations of objects. Okay, so we have our main program here. Okay, and what we designed there in our example was a student object. Okay, and what happened is the main object created a student, okay, using the blueprint that was defined in this class, it created a student inside of itself. Okay, and that's totally fine. That's exactly how it kind of works. Okay, you, you, what we're doing is we're setting up the blueprint of the object so that the main program can knows how to create one. All right. Now, when we're talking about different types of classes, though, there's different things that we can do. There's some classes that are meant to represent objects. Okay, so we can have here objects. Okay, and some classes that represent more like a collection of ideas. Okay, so for instance, like objects might be like students. Okay, um, a monster. Okay, uh, something like, um, I don't know, like a car or a building. Okay, these things would be actual things that have, they, now they have attributes and they have methods, but they actually represent um, things, okay? Now, those things um, are all different, okay? So we can have, for instance, more than one student. So for instance, we could have three students and 12 monsters, right? Each one of them would be different from each other, okay? So that if you change one student's name, it shouldn't change the name for all students. All right. Now we also have ideas on the other hand. Okay. Now ideas are things like math. Okay. Spelling. Uh, rules. Okay. So things like that. Now typically we don't have different maths. Okay. We don't have like two different kinds of math. It's just math. All right. Now what that means, okay, is that we only ever have one of them. And if you change the rules, or if you change the attributes of math, it would change it for all math, not just this one case of math or this one instance of math. Right? Typically, in programming, what it would mean is that these things would be described as static or static. OK? 
Okay, and these things would be non-static. Okay, now what static means is that we have our main program and the main program has memory associated with it. Okay, so this is a memory stack here. Okay, I'm not going to take a long time to draw this nicely. Okay, now when the main program creates an object, what it can do is it, it gives each one its own memory. Okay, so when you create a new student, okay, student goes into the memory. I'll call this student number one. Okay, when you create another student, that student goes into its own memory as well. Okay, now when you create a static uh, one, okay, when you use a static method. What happens is it gets its own memory too. So let's say I add math. Okay, but I never actually create more than one math. And anytime I ever use that math, it's always that same math. Okay, so what it means is by static, and static means unmoving, it means that it's always in here. Okay, so what it means is you never create different instances of that same method. Okay, now what that allows us to do is if we go to the code, Okay. As we can see, I'll just change this, is that the student okay, should have been declared as being non-static, right? Because this, when we create students, we create different types of students, all right? So what we're going to do is take away the static modifiers here. Now, taking away the static modifier means that the student has to be created Okay, in order for you to use it, and you have to, and you can only use that particular instance of that, okay, of that uh, student. Okay, so each one can be different. Okay, so we took away all the static modifiers. Okay, this isn't going to change the outcome of our program. Okay, because nothing is static. All right. Um, okay. Now, what this means is here I have student Jimmy equals new student. Okay, and I have student. Betty is equal to new student, and I will call her a different way. Betty, who's 16 in grade 11. Okay, and let's just take this away. And I can say system action. Here I'll have say Jimmy, I'll put your name. And uh, here I'll just do Betty the same thing. Okay, I should note that I named uh, my variable names with capital letters here, but the convention is that you shouldn't. Okay, although the class the, the class definition starts with a capital letter, the variable still should start with a lowercase letter. So I guess this is a case of do as I say, not as I do. Okay, but just so you know. All right, so I run this, and I have Jane Doe and Betty. Okay, and the reason why is because Jimmy was created using the default constructor, and Betty was created with her own uh, constructor. Okay, a modified constructor. Okay, now what this means is that we have two students in our program, two student variables. Each one has its own attributes, so they're completely different. Okay, um, a, a good example of a static class is one like math. Okay, so you know, system dot print line. Okay, and if you notice, you may have used this math dot random. Okay, so math dot random generates a number between zero and one. All right, but notice that this math, okay, the dot operator means you're accessing a portion of it. So math must be a class. Okay, but we never created a math class, right? We never, well, it's in the libraries, but we never actually said math new is equal to new math. We didn't assign it a name. We never instantiated a new one. Okay, that's because math doesn't require instanti instantiation because it's static, okay? Which means that as soon as you run the program, it gets, it gets its own memory assigned to it, right? So it exists in the memory even though you didn't specifically create an instance of it, okay? What this means, though, is that all the maths that I access are all the same math, 
all right? They don't change from instance to instance. So when I use math.random in one case, it's not going to give me a number from 100 to 200, right? It's always the same one because it only exists as an idea, all right? That's typically how static and non-static works, okay? And that's why I said that they typically, things that represent objects, okay, because you can have different objects that represent, that have different attributes and different methods, um, they all have, they all are generally non-static, meaning that you have to create them one at a time and they have to be created um, so that they each have their own attributes. But things like ideas okay, are typically um, are typically not changing. So one math is the same as all the other maths. Okay, and that means that it's typically made in a static way. And that means you don't have to invoke um, its constructor. You don't have to actually create it in any particular way. Okay, Every math is always the same. Okay, um, hopefully that helps out with um, classes. It takes a little bit of use to and getting used to, and it also takes some experience to know how classes are useful and what, when they're appropriate. Okay, but hopefully that gives you an overview on classes. And if you have any questions, drop me a line and uh, please consider subscribing.